Welcome back. We are almost done with the CPU portion of the NES emulator. Before we wrap up, I thought I'd share some tips and tricks that helped me while building my emulator. Even though the 6502 CPU was originally released in 1975, it is still a fairly complex device. There are many opportunities for errors while developing an emulator. Without deep familiarity of the CPU, catching issues can be very tricky. Any small change in behavior can result in programs running differently than they would on real hardware. So we need a good solution for testing our CPU emulator. One way of testing is to write conventional unit tests, ensuring each instruction works exactly as expected. Though, for the number of instructions on this CPU, this can prove to be a significant amount of effort. Another approach would be to write small programs and confirm that the results match that of another trusted system. This can either be a physical system with a real 6502, or another emulated system that you trust the results of. Differences in behavior can then be reconciled using a 6502 reference. This helps avoid duplicating any issues that might exist in another emulator. One especially useful test program is nesttest.ness. This program helps test both standard functionality of most 6502 instructions, but also some tricky edge cases. The program is a collection of test cases and can run through each sequentially. Errors are reported by writing the number of the failing test into a particular location in memory. This allows you to automatically check for failures by running this automatically in your test framework. If all the tests pass, then a zero will be found in this address. If an error occurs, then the failing test is written instead. To get a sense of just how comprehensive this test suite is, let's take a look at some of these error codes. One way to run nest test is to run it completely and check for errors. Though this helps, it can still be challenging to find exactly the cause of the error. Another way to use nest test is using nesttest.log. This file contains the expected internal state of each of the CPU registers before and after each instruction. As you run nest test in your emulator, you can compare the resulting state against the one found in the log. This is extremely useful because you can catch discrepancies as soon as they occur. This gives you the best chance of actually understanding the cause of the problem. One challenge in running nest test with an early CPU emulator is that it is packaged as a .nest file. This contains other information about the cartridge. Using nesttest.nest thus requires decoding the header and extracting the program code. To make testing a little easier, I have actually repackaged nesttest.nest as a bin file so that no parsing of a nest header is required. You can simply load the .bin file into your emulator's memory at a certain address and then set the emulator's program counter to that address and start running. I will include more details about how to use this in a link in the description. Now that we have testing out of the way, I thought I would share some tricky issues that I encountered while building my emulator. First up is page crossing. Some instructions take shortcuts in order to allow faster execution. One example of this is the lack of page crossing seen in some instructions. A page is a range of memory, 256 bytes long, starting at some ZZ00 and ending at some ZZFF. ZZ can be any two numbers. A page crossing is when moving from an address at a lower page, say ZZ, to the next page, or ZZ plus one. Most addressing modes operate only on single bytes for memory. However, some of the addressing modes use indirection, where an address in memory is expected to hold the first byte of a full two-byte address. The input is then retrieved from that other address. The indirect indexed address mode does this and does something like the following. Load A, A, D, Y. What this does is first read the start address from A, D. We'll call this A. Then it interprets memory at A and A plus one as a 16 byte address. Then it adds the current value of the Y register to that value and treats the result as an address for the input. This allows the 6502 to effectively implement arrays, for example. One quirk, however, is that the two bytes used in step two cannot cross a page. So if A was, for example, 00FF, in step two, the resulting 
address would come from 00FF and 0000. When 1 is added to that lower byte, it goes from FF to 00. However, the resulting carry from FF that would have normally turned it into hex 0100 is actually dropped. This allows the CPU to avoid the wait for the carry. This allows a speed up in this addressing mode, but this quirk is somewhat surprising. It definitely surprised myself. Another class of issues that I encountered is that with memory space collisions. Early in testing, I would load demo programs starting at address zero. I had written a few test programs, particularly those that use the stack and the zero page, and these would have strange incorrect behavior. The issue is that zero page uses addresses from zero zero to FF, and stack operations use from 0100 and 01FF. If your program is also loaded in a place that overlaps with these ranges, then using the zero page or manipulating the stack may actually overwrite bytes in your program. One final quirk is that addressing modes can actually be treated in two different ways. An argument for an instruction behaves slightly differently if the argument is an input or an output. Here we have two example instructions that we've seen before load A and store A, loading 00, 0 or storing into 00. 0. Typically code would treat this using a pointer, so the emulated addressing mode code would return an address. However, the quirks that we saw earlier with the page crossing means that the emulator isn't actually writing into a single memory address. Instead, your addressing mode code will likely just need the ability to read or write to the argument as described by the addressing mode. And with that, we've covered most of the tricky issues in the 6502. If you're following along, at this point, you should have the knowledge required to build a functional 6502 emulator, and it should be capable of running some basic programs that only need to read and write from memory. Next up, we'll start looking at cartridges, how cartridges work, how they store programs and data, and how our emulator can emulate cartridge hardware. That's all for now. See you on the next one.